You are a leader. Everyone here this morning is a leader. You may never be president of the United States. You may never be president of the General Conference. But you will lead someone to make a choice to either eternal life or eternal death. At some point, everyone here will set an example that someone will follow. Because leadership is so important, God provides instruction for leaders in Scripture. This morning we're going to be looking at two leaders. One leader illustrates a leadership failure and the other illustrates a leadership success. We want to thoughtfully examine what made the difference, but before we open the Bible, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the Bible. We don't want to misunderstand it. I pray not to misuse it. I pray that it may bring hope and comfort and warning and everything that you intended, that your word may not come back to you void. And it will strike us with a new force and power. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and 14. These verses serve as an obituary to the first leader and an introduction to the second. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance but he did not re inquire of the Lord. And therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over, over to David, the son of Jesse. These two verses provide the Bible summary of the life of King Saul. On his epitaph, no good deeds are recalled. There are no redeeming positives. There's no hint of praise. Saul's reign, which began with such promise, closed with utter and complete failure. Notice three great errors are singled out. Two are sins of omission, and one is a sin of commission. These three errors caused the judgment of heaven to fall on him. These errors ruined his life and his kingdom, and he lost both this life and the life to come. But Saul's three errors are among the most common errors of leaders today. First, he failed to keep the word of God. Second, he sought the counsel from a spiritualist medium. And third, he failed to inquire of the Lord. Let's briefly examine these problems of Saul. First, Saul didn't keep the word of God. Moses instructed the people how to keep the word of God. They were to keep God's instruction before their eyes constantly. They were to keep God's words in their ears continually. And they were to keep God's word on their lips. They were to talk of it to their children and grandchildren. They were to keep God's word in their minds, meditating on it night and day. The instruction in the word of God was to regulate their going out and their coming in. <clears throat> God's word was to monitor every thought and every action. Am I on? Every thought and every action. Um, what they ate, when they ate it. God's word was to supervise even their choice of clothes to wear. And the word of God was to encompass all their life. Moses summarized this all-encompassing instruction by saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In keeping the word of God, we call obedience. While our daughter Ruthie was here a few weeks ago, she went to physical therapy for a back problem to keep her son, one and a half years uh, old Hudson, from interfering with the therapy. She told him not to cross the line. Hudson loves his mother and wants to be with her constantly. But notice how he kept the word of his mother. Please disregard any music playing in the background of the PT department. Hudson never did go across the line for the entire 30 minutes of treatment. Now I'm not going to play it for 30 minutes. 
God gave specific instruction to kings to set an example for every citizen to follow. The king was told that regardless of where he was, he must keep the word of God with him. And the word of God was not simply a talisman, a good luck charm, which the king was to carry. He was to read it <clears throat> all the days of his life. He was not to simply be a hearer of the word. He was to be a doer of the word, for the text continues, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Furthermore, the king was warned not to regard himself as being above the law, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left. But Saul was not careful to follow and obey the Bible in every detail. He did not study it carefully. He did not compare his life to the Bible pattern. King Saul did not build his life on a solid foundation. He did not build his life on the word of God. This problem led to every other problem in his life and it led to his ultimate failure. He wanted God to be his servant. He wasn't willing to be God's servant. God gave Saul instruction, but where Saul's ideas, Saul's judgment differed from God's instruction, he followed his own way. Saul did what was right in his own eyes. Saul did not fully surrender his plans and ideas to God. He confused partial obedience with complete obedience. Saul told Samuel with a self-satisfied air after he had only partially obeyed God, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He illustrated the truth of Solomon's observations, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. When reproved for his errors, he felt misunderstood and mistreated. He justified himself, he defended his way, he felt his way was superior to God's way. Saul was like the Pharisees which said, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. Finally, in places seeking to make sure that all human praise was directed to God in his word, Saul sought to direct praise to himself. He desired the adulation of men. When David received higher praise than he received, Saul became jealous and angry and actually sought to kill David. Saul's life is to serve a warning to every leader. God's word provides us the detailed instruction we need in order to be, to be like Jesus in, in the way we live, how we do our work, how we relate to others. Jesus lived by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Before our conversion, we lived by our own inclinations. But when we accept Christ, we become entirely new creations. And we have new standards for thoughts, words, and actions. Adventist Tome 21, those who, after receiving the truth, make no change in word or deportment, in dress or surroundings, are living to themselves, not to Christ. If we made no change when we accepted Jesus, we didn't accept Jesus. They have not been created anew in Christ Jesus unto purification and holiness. If the Bible is not changing us, we're not keeping the word of God. Many are going directly contrary to the light which God has given to his people because they do not read the books which contain the light and knowledge and cautions, reproofs and warnings. The books are given because they're needed. No wonder Isaiah instructs us, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. True education will take you to the word of God, not away from the word of God. True education will enable you to see greater and greater value in God's word. Deuteronomy 4, 6, keep therefore and do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. As a leader, the king was given additional instruction so that he could set the example for all of Israel. What was registered in the books of heaven regarding Saul's life will be registered against us. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he committed against the Lord because he did not keep the way of the word of the Lord. It will be registered if we do what Saul did. Saul's refusal to obey the word of the Lord was the first and foremost reason he perished. By ignoring God's instruction, it'll always lead to seeking and follow Satan's instruction. If you disobey God, we will seek and obey Satan. The same moment we reject God's counsel is the moment we accept Satan's. You may ne never go to seances, play with Ouija boards, or consult fortune tellers and palm readers, but 
you will be no less certainly dabbling in sorcery. All we need is to hear God's word and not do it. Like Saul, we may flatter ourselves to justify our disobedience and claims it doesn't matter or it is obedience, but ultimately we'll, we are consulting sorcerers in an effort to gain counsel. That's what Saul did. He consulted a sorcerer to get Samuel's guidance. Saul thought he could get God's counsel from satanic sources. Like the witch's cave, Babylon is the dwelling place of demons. When we go to Babylon for our answers, our education and our training, we are joining Saul in the witch's cave. Whenever or whenever or wherever we use a method to get instruction from God, forbidden by God, we are doing exactly what King Saul did. Many teachers and students believe the only way they can get necessary knowledge is by going to sources that God has forbidden us to study. Multitudes seek wisdom from Babylonian sources God has condemned. Could the veil be lifted, we would see angels employing all their arts to deceive and destroy. If we could see, see the invisible world right around us right now, we could see forces of good and evil and and constant con uh, conflict. Satan and his evil angels, we're told, are watching at every avenue leading to the human heart, seeking to force souls to accept evil suggestions. What are the avenues to the soul? The eyes, what we consent to look at and then think about. The ears, what we choose to listen and think about the taste buds, what we select to eat and think about, and finally, the sensation of touch. Like predators watching for prey, Satan and his evil angels are watching at every avenue leading to the human heart. They seek to entice us to look, listen, eat, touch, that which gives them the opportunity to gain control of uh, our minds and be able to force us to accept their evil suggestions. Now, how can we know when it is evil angels seeking to influence us? Whenever an influence is exerted to cause men to forget God, the quotation continues, there Satan is exercising his bewitching power. Any thought, any distraction that would take our minds away from God and his word is from an evil one. The quote then continues with a universal truth that implies to all, young and old, educated or ignorant, rich, poor, or male or female, Notice that none are excluded. All who do certain things or engage in certain activities are, are what? Tampering with sorcery. In 1890, a spiritualist invented and introduced the Ouija board. When I was growing up, I learned of well-documented cases of young people who developed severe mental problems, paranoia, obsessions, psychosis, and depression after playing a game. Of course, there are fortune tellers, palm readers, and many forms of demon communication that can lead to the same problems. Most members at South Bay are wise enough not to play with rattlesnakes and are not interested in such things. But this statement lists five very common activities that are just as dangerous, some perhaps even more so, because they're hidden. We live next to Eric and Rachel and we use our back entrance to most conveniently come and go to their house. What we did not know was that danger lurked on that porch. What seemed safe to us was unsafe with unexpected dangers that were hidden for wasps were building nests in secluded uh, places. Our discovery of the dangers was unpleasant. Let me play some footage from a surveillance camera. I am playing some silent footage, triggered by motion. Eric is carrying baby Hudson and goes up the stairs. They're followed by my daughter Ruthie, who's very pregnant and waddling up the stairs. Uh, you can see that she suddenly becomes very animated as she is stung by an unexpected attack of wasps uh, defending their nests. Let me show it from a different uh, camera. Ouch, 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 ouch. Don't let him get stung. Okay, well, let's open the Here. door. Okay, go inside. 
I can't go inside. This doesn't open the... Do you get stung? Yeah, really bad. Where? Oh back. Okay, go inside. Just get in inside before you get Let's stung. Go inside. Ooh, I think I'll go out a different door. I'm so sorry. Uh, Eric's response is reasonable. I think I'll go out of a different door. If there's danger, wise people avoid it. Let's look at areas where danger hides um, that can take unsuspecting individuals by surprise. All who venture into scenes of dissipation, dissipation is defined as drunkenness, drug use, or immorality. When we willingly go where there is drunkenness, drug use, or immorality, we are in a place of danger as surely as Saul was in danger when he ventured into the haunt of the witch of Endor. All who venture into scenes of irreligious pleasure. Irreligious pleasure is entertainment that's not focused on God where a Bible study would seem out of place. All who seek the society of the sensualist. A sensualist is an individual devoted to sexual pleasure. We are surrounded by such individuals in our Sodom society. We can't come and uh, avoid coming in contact with them, but we are in danger when we seek them out like Saul sought out the witch of Endor. All who seek the society of the skeptic. A skeptic is one who expresses doubts about the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. All who seek the society of the blasphemer. This is one who uses God's name tritely in conversations and mocks spiritual things and mocks spiritual people. All who venture into scenes of dissipation or irreligious pleasure or seek the society of the sensualist, the skeptic, or the blasphemer by personal intercourse are tampering with sorcery. We can go where we participate in entertainment, shows, sports, with drinking, drugs, carousing, lawless, godless pleasure. We can have immoral friends or friends that are skeptical of the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, mock God's word and those who believe it. But we don't need to go to such individuals when they're personally present. Notice what it says. All who venture into the scenes of dissipation or irreligious pleasure or seek the society of the sensualist, the skeptic, or the blasphemer, read it with me, through the medium of the press are tampering with sorcery. We can just as readily tamper with sorcery by venturing into scenes of dissipation or irreligious pleasure or association with the immoral, the skeptical, the blasphemer through the media with computer games, movies, radio, magazines, newspapers, books, including textbooks. In places spending quiet evenings as a family, listening to God's word, thousands are listening to Satan's messengers on radio, TV, movies, internet, just as if they were joining King Saul and visiting the witch of Endor. Satan is communicating his messages just as surely in the one as he was in the other. And this is going directly contrary to the instruction that God has given his people. Review in Herald 1226, 1882. The secular papers are filled with accounts of murders, robberies, and other revolting crimes, and the mind of the reader dwells on the scenes of vice therein depicted. This is newspapers and news magazines. This was written before radio, television, and internet, but includes all these things. It includes movies and fiction. Notice how the quotation continues. By indulgence, the reading of sensational or demoralizing literature becomes a habit, like the use of opium or other baleful drugs. Dear folk, we can be as addicted to improper reading, improper news, as someone is addicted to drugs. And as a result, the minds of, what's the next word? Thousands are enfeebled debased, and even crazed. We see this all around us in the violence and crime, crazed people filling the nation. And the solution, God's word says, is stop the habit through the power of God. Satan is doing more through the productions of the press to weaken the minds and corrupt the morals of the youth than by any other means. But all reading, 
of the character, this character, be, what does it say? Banished from your houses. Let books that are useful, instructive, and elevating be placed in your libraries and upon our tables. During long winter evenings, let parents see that all their children are at home. And then let the time be devoted to the reading of the scriptures and other interesting books that will impart knowledge and inculcate right principles. Let the best reader be selected to read aloud while other members of the family are engaged in useful occupations. Thus these evenings at home may be made both pleasant and profitable. Pure healthful reading will be to the mind what healthful food is to the body. Dear folk, as a church, we teach the importance of healthful eating. But as a church, we teach the importance of healthful reading, food for the mind. You will thus become stronger to resist temptation, to form right habits, and to act upon right principles. That's what I want. Isn't that what you want? God gives much instruction on modern mediums. For example, God tells teachers and students, don't study infidel authors. Even if professors may demand it, studying so, such books is no different than consulting mediums. God does not somehow absolve us from the guilt and consequences of sin if our teacher tells us to do it, or it is necessary to study to get good grades, or even to obtain a degree. We are people of truth and are not to study fictitious literature. Though professors may justify requiring the study of books and students may comply, they're both tampering with sorcery as surely as if they were consulting spiritualist mediums. Not all fiction is labeled fiction. Not all fiction is in the fiction section of the library. Much fiction is mislabeled as truth. Many religious books and textbooks, psychological, philosophical books, history books, science books are either fiction or contain fiction. Demons stand by the side of any author who is essentialist, skeptic, or blasphemer as they write. And when we read, watch, listen to, or play the games that demons inspire, we are tampering with sorcery. Ere they are aware, the mind is bewildered and the soul polluted. And that's not the end of it. Like Eve, those who yield to temptation become tempters in their turn. In committing sin, they make themselves the ministers of sin. As soon as I sin, I'm an ordained minister. Minister of sin. The agents of Satan through whom he can work with success to perpetuate sin. Those who study infidel authors, fictitious literature, drama, theological, historical, psychological, philosophical falsehood will then teach this to others. This is not a theoretical danger. It is what is happening now in many schools. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Are we seeing mediums? Are we inviting evil angels into our homes? Consulting Satan for guidance is the second way leaders can be destroyed. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But there's a third problem that brought destruction to Saul. He did not inquire of the Lord. He didn't seek the way of the Lord. He didn't ask for God's directions. He consulted his wishes, his desires, his pace, his, his preferences. And that provided all the guidance he felt he needed. He sought to please the people rather than please the Lord. He didn't cry out to God for guidance. This is also a common error by leaders. The shepherds are senseless, are senseless and do not inquire of the Lord so they do not prosper and all their flock is scattered. This was the error, error Joshua made when entering a treaty with the Gibeonites. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. 
David explained that this was the air that was made when the sanctuary was brought into Jerusalem, causing the death of Uzzah. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. This was the error of Ahab's son Ahaziah, who did not inquire of the Lord. Of, uh, it cost him his life, his salvation, his kingdom. Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. This was the error of the Pharisees. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. Inquiring of God was never Saul's first thought. He always felt competent to decide for himself. It was not Saul, but Saul's servant who suggested they see the prophet Samuel to find lost animals. Saul didn't value Samuel's instruction enough to wait for it when Samuel was delayed. On another occasion when he inquired of the Lord, Saul didn't think there was time to wait for counsel. It was the high priest that had to suggest counseling with God in one battle with the Philistines. The village of Ramah where Samuel dwelt was about six to seven miles from Gibeah where Saul lived. But Saul never made that little trip to seek counsel of Samuel and he never called Samuel to come to his headquarters and give counsel to his advisors. There were several reasons Saul didn't inquire of the Lord. We've already mentioned he didn't take the time for counsel. He wasn't willing to wait for it. This is a common reason people do not receive counsel from God. Most of you are familiar with the following quotation. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. What's their problem? They are in, read it with me, too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work, and this was Saul's problem. But there was another problem that kept him, him from inquiring of the word of God. He didn't like God's counsel through the prophet Samuel. It made him feel condemned. <laughs> Many are like Saul. Not much reading of the testimonies, messages to young people, Adventist home, child guidance. It makes them feel condemned. So they don't read the books. But the first work of the Holy Spirit is to convince of sin. It's not easier for me to like God's counsel when it goes against my desires. If you've not read the nine volumes of the testimonies by the time you finish college, you are woefully, grossly uneducated. Any parchment given to a graduate that has not read this valuable source of true wisdom is overstating the graduate's limited knowledge and accomplishments. Years ago, God me, gave me an illustration of how I should value and accept God's counsel in my life. We had a young pastor by the name of Don McIntosh. He wanted to see our congregation more active in soul winning. That was head elder. And together we sought to carefully study God's counsel. We prayed together and as we discovered pertinent instruction from God's word, we would share it with each other. And God blessed Pastor Don in his inquiry, his search after God's word. And the church grew under his ministry. Some years later, Pastor Don worked with a school principal who was initiating school activities that God's word forbade. But he wouldn't study and pray with us. He rejected the most clear instruction. He wouldn't read it. He explained it away. When an individual will not listen to God's word, no words of man can help him. Jesus said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. We place ourselves where nothing can reach us. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. How opposite was David's life? He valued the word of God. 
Again and again, he wrote of its importance. At the end of his life, he wrote and sang, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Because he sought and found God's word, he had neither need nor desire to consult the medium. David habitually sought guidance from God for the decisions of his life. When Saul attempted to kill him, David fled to Samuel, now a very old man, to receive direction, guidance, and instruction from God. Later, when David was forced to flee again and unable to flee to Samuel, he fled to the sanctuary in Nob. Nob was only two miles from Saul's headquarters, and David was observed here. Then answered Duag the Edomite, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitib, and he inquired of the Lord for him. David fled to the sanctuary to inquire of God. Inquiring of God at the sanctuary was David's habit. Notice the answer that Ahimelech, the high priest, gave to Saul when he was questioned by the king about David's inquiring of the Lord. Was today the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. David frequently consulted the Lord. To have God's guidance was a chief desire of David's life. He sang about it. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. And God gave him guidance. Now the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. Notice how God arranged to guide David when he was fleeing and unable to go again to the prophet Samuel, God sent a prophet to him. And David followed God's guidance plan, so David departed and went into the forest of Herod. After King Saul had the high priest slain in Nob, the high priest, son of Abiathar, escaped to David. Abiathar brought the ephod with him. The ephod was the sacred garment worn by the priest that would provide God's guidance. When David was fleeing and unable to go to the sanctuary, God brought the sanctuary to him. Those who want God's guidance can have it. David was constantly inquiring of the Lord before engaging in any matter, even good matters. David sought God's direction. Then they told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keala and they are robbing the threshing floors. David didn't respond to this news of the Keala's residents suffering without confidence. Uh, he didn't uh, respond to this news, say, oh, we gotta go rescue them. He counseled with God. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keala. And that should have been the end of it. David and his men would save Keala, but it wasn't the end of it. David's men were not convinced that God's instruction was wise and trustworthy. And David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired of the Lord once again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise and go to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. And David and his men went to Keilah, fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. After delivering the Keilah residents from the Philistines, the inhabitants were faced with a new danger. The grateful inhabitants of, of the town spread the news of David's deliverance far and wide. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. When Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men, then Saul called them. The city of Keala, just rescued from the Philippine, Philistines, now faced a siege from Saul. Yet in all this, Saul was trying to be deceptive, but notice how God's guidance cut through Saul's dishonesty. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. What was on the ephod? At the right and left of the breastplate were two large stones of great brilliancy. They were known as the Urim and Thummim. By them, the will of God was made known through the high priest. When questions were brought for decision before the Lord, a halo of light encircling the precious stone at the right was a token of the divine consent or approval 
while a cloud shadowing the stone at the left was an evidence of denial or disapprobation. With the ephod and its Urim and Thummim, David was able to establish communication with God. It was his uh, Wi-Fi system. And then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? I've just rescued them. And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So much thanks. When a mutiny among his supporters was brewing and David was in danger of being killed, not by Saul, but by his own followers, God's guidance brought peace and unity. After Saul's death, when in perplexity as to when to, where to relocate, David found the counsel of the Lord to be reliable. When battling the Philistines, David received battle plans from God. When attempting to understand the cause of a prolonged famine, David was informed of the cause and then knew what course to pursue. Following God's directions brought David success and a blessing in every undertaking. Compare the results of David's leadership with the results of Saul's leadership. At the end of Saul's life, his kingdom was in shambles. He had killed the high priest Abiathar, the only surviving priest, then fled for his life. Hey, he'd killed the high priest, and, and Abiathar, the only surviving priest, had, had uh, fled for his life. The ephod was with David, brought by the high priest. The sanctuary was closed. Saul's example was copied by others. The Bible record is as sad as it is clear. The ark of our God we did not inquire of during the reign of Saul. David diligently sought and obtained God's guidance. The nation observed the blessing of, God's rely, of David's reliance on God instead of himself. The citizens desired the same blessing of God's guidance in their lives. And all Israel said, let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The sanctuary was restored. Everyone here this morning is a leader. The very first lesson of leadership is to counsel with God and follow his counsel. Are you seeking God's delight, guidance for all the decisions of your life? When the sanctuary was restored, all Israel had access to God's guidance again. Hebrews 4 tells us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Since October 22, 1844, this sanctuary has been restored. We have access to the high priest and covered by his blood, we can come boldly into his presence. No one can take this sanctuary away. We can go to a high priest better than Abiathar. We can receive guidance from one more reliable than Samuel. The promise is, the Lord shall guide thee continually. Ellen White wrote, frequently I receive letters from individuals telling me of their troubles and perplexities and asking me to inquire of God as to what is their duty. To those for whom the Lord has given me no light, I have often replied, I have not been appointed by God to do such a work as you asked me to do. The Lord Jesus has invited you to bring your troubles to one who understands every circumstances of your life. Aren't you glad? Would you like to be guided continually every step, every decision? I loved it when we finally had a GPS. Uh, a word would say, turn here. Or if we turned wrong, it would recalibrate and give us a new direction. Get us back on track. And God has a GPS for us. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, wonderful guidance, wonderful GPS. How do we get this guidance? When you rise in the morning, 3T6, 363, um, in my uh, room at uh, medical school, someone had kindly 
put in great big writing this quotation for me to see on the wall every morning. Great big. When you rise in the morning, do you feel your helplessness and your need of strength from God? And do you humbly, heartily make known your wants to your heavenly Father? If so, angels mark your prayers. And if these prayers have not gone forth out of feigned lips, when you are in danger of unconsciously doing wrong and exerting an influence which will lead others to do wrong, your guardian angel will be by your side, prompting you to a better course, choosing your words for you, and influencing your actions.
So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. May that never be said of us. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we want to be guided by you moment by moment. May we remember, remind us to seek your face in the morning. We need it. To accept your guidance throughout the day. May this week be one of fellowship with you by our sides every moment, choosing our words, making us a blessing to those we come in contact with. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.